was on the USS Hadley at the Battle of Okinawa uh, to talk about his experiences of, with uh, shooting down those uh, airplanes. Uh, that's where the term came from so many years ago that I heard on uh, Victory at Sea. It was uh, young men wanting to live fighting against young men wanting to die. Okay. Up close. Is this clear enough? Can you all hear me back there? Okay. Thank you very much, folks. I uh, told I was uh, given 15 minutes, so I figured I could have you all out of here by about 3 o'clock. It's okay? <laughs> anyway. Uh, it's a very humbling experience to be here among so many World War II veterans and listen to the stories that they have to tell. And I think, oh boy, how do I fit in with this gang? And then we all have individual experiences to tell. And I think I'll tell you uh, one or two of mine and see if I can hopefully measure up to the gentleman in front of me here. Am I getting the microphone close enough? Is that better? Yeah, better. Okay, all right. Uh, I'll tell you just a little bit about myself, about myself so you'll know where I'm coming from. I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1922, and before you all start doing all the calculations to find out how old I am, tomorrow is my 90th birthday. Uh, and, and I'm very pleased to be able to, to uh, join all these other gentlemen here, ladies who are that age and older, many of them. So uh, let's get on with the story. Uh, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and moved uh, to Palo Alto, California, where I graduated from high school in 1940, attended a civilian military training camp at Fort Ord to learn something about my art, about the Army, which my father and, and uncle and all, all were part of during World War I, and they thought that'd be great to go in the Army. Well, I went through that for four months. When I got out of there, I had learned a lot of things, one of which was I didn't want to go in the Army. <laughs> So the fellow in the fraternity house that I was living in in San Jose State uh, and I got together and we thought, uh, well, uh, you know, let's look around a little bit and see what we can do. Pearl Harbor happened when I was just under 20 and in the middle of my sophomore year at San Jose State and then uh, we had to hustle because the draft was coming very, very fast. And so we signed up in the Navy, and many of us, and we were told to go back to school, young man, and try to complete your college if you can, just keep it raised up and we'll call you when we want you. So they let me complete my junior year and called me in, in June of 1943 and uh, put me in uniform and sent me to UCLA. UCLA, I completed another semester of my college my career down there in uniform. And then they sent me to the University of New York City and I completed another semester there and was handed a commission in the Navy at the same time San Jose State gave me a, a, a diploma from college. So I was pretty well set to go from there. I was uh, tagged at the, at the completion of my midshipman school to be uh, an officer on a destroyer. I'd never been to sea, I'd never been on a destroyer. I didn't know what they were, but that's where I was going. So I went to destroyer school in North Virginia, learned how to shoot all the guns on the ship how to fire torpedoes, how to work in the engineering department, how to go through firefighting school, damage control school, because everyone on a destroyer has to work at something when the, when the emergency bell rings. So from that point, I was assigned to either a new destroyer or an old destroyer on the East Coast or the West Coast. I chose new destroyer on the West Coast, and that's what I got, fortunately. So I put this ship in commission uh, So this is the ship that I helped put in commission in, uh, in November of 1944. This is a, the newest destroyer in the fleet, and it was uh, the most powerful thing that the world had as far as destroyers were concerned in those days. Now this ship is 376 feet long, it is 2,200 tons, has 360 men aboard, 
and uh, can rapidly uh, achieve 40 miles an hour uh, from the start in just a few minutes. And it's a very powerful ship, but they're called tin cans because the, the arm of armor of the ship is about the size, about the thickness of a tin can. You won't stop anything hard. Well, it may from a rifle, but it won't stop a, a big gun from a big ship. And therefore, they're very fragile, and they uh, can turn rapidly, and they can do anything at sea, but boy, don't get hit. Well, this destroyer was a pride and joy. We all have loved it. And we found out that we were soon destined for the Far East to go out on, on uh, we didn't know what. And we had an escorted aircraft carrier from uh, San Diego to Pearl Harbor, and another escort job from Pearl Harbor uh, on to Ulithi. Ulithi is a, a coral atoll in the Caroline Islands, east of the Philippines, and out in the middle of nowhere. And when we pulled into Ulithi, I was so surprised. I had never seen so many ships in all my life. There were aircraft carriers lined up as far as I could see, destroyers by the hundreds, literally by the hundreds. There were cruisers, battleships, everything. The Navy was assembling there the largest armada ever known to man. The largest armada, it topped that which was for D-Day in Normandy, there were more ships, uh, and it's unbelievable. And we there we found out that we were destined for Okinawa, and we hadn't heard too much about them, but they were there, the kamikaze. So at uh, uh, some time in the middle of March, we left there, loaded with all our ammunition, food, and everything else, headed for Okinawa with a, this large armada of troop ships, cargo ships, boilers, aircraft carriers, and everything. And um, we, uh, it, it took a long time to get there. There's some of these LSTs, long, slow targets, as sometimes they're called, but they're, they're transports, to carrying troops and tanks and trucks and everything else needed for the invasion of Okinawa. And it took a long time to get there because many of the ships were very slow. On the night before the, the landing, the landing was on April 1st, Easter Sunday, April Fool's Day, April 1st, 1945. And the night before, we got our first taste of firing guns at real live airplanes. And we shot down what's known as a Betty, which is a Japanese twin-engine bomber. And that was our first, uh, first kamikaze uh, experience. And uh, we went on in for landing the, the following morning, delivering our troop ships to the beach, along with many, many, many destroyers. There were about 200 destroyers in the, in the invasion of Okinawa. The, uh, the invasion went very well. We didn't go ashore, but we did use a little bit of shore bombardment to assist the light landing of the, tr of the troops. And we did a lot of submarine patrol to prevent submarines from coming in to get the troop ships. And we didn't, we didn't have any luck. We didn't have any submarines around there that we knew of. Uh, soon we were told we would escort a, a Marine Division back to Saipan because the invasion wasn't ready for them yet. You can't keep a bunch of Marines cooped up on a ship and keep them in condition and keep them well trained and up on the stick, as you say, ready to go without exercise and without practice and without firing their guns again. So we went to Ta Saipan with them and then brought them back to Okinawa in, in a few days. And then uh, we went uh, down to the Karama Reto Islands, which is a group of islands just south of Okinawa, uh, southwest. And the uh, Karama Reto Islands are known as the graveyard of destroyers. With so many destroyers were getting hit by kamikazes, they had to have an assembly point for them to have them towed into so that they could get repaired and go back out on the line again. And we saw a sister ship of ours down there with, had, uh, the deck was just totally destroyed 
by kamikazes. And we steamed by them and gave them a, a big salute. And the, the words which were expressed by our crew as they saw the damage, damage on his sister ship, the words are unprintable. It just, uh, we were amazed at what was happening. Little did we know that three weeks later we would be tied alongside them in a similar condition. So we went up and out on the radar picket line. Now, I don't think many people see this. That is a picture of the Western Pacific. 